fact, I shall send you live, Councillor Locke. Thank you. And when you're ready, uh, you're live now, Councillor Locke. Good evening, everyone. This is Councillor Mary Locke. Uh, just to say welcome to my uh, Councillor Ward meeting uh, for Sturchley. Um, this is uh, Microsoft Teams Live, just to say also that uh, the meeting is being recorded live and it will be able to be viewed on the Council's website. I've got a, couple, a few things to announce. The first thing, um, Alison Brinkworth um, uh, is here as a guest, but I'm going to read out the <clears throat> statement about the um, census. Every 10 years, uh, there's a census in the country. And this year, um, the census day will be on March the 21st. This, this, the survey, this, the nationwide survey only happens every 10 years, but it is important to take part because it, it helps decide how services are planned and funded for local area and for doctor surgeries and bus, uh, bus routes. It gives the most detailed information we have about our society and getting accurate, important, inf accurate data is important to help millions of pounds be invested where it needs to go, even help voluntary organisations and charities get support for funding applications. Every household will receive a letter from early March with an online code allowing them to join online um, and, uh, and put the primary code in. But people will get details on how to request a paper copy if required. There will be language, digital and accessibility support available for everyone who needs it through the census support centres, phone lines and online help. Right. Uh, Census Engagement Manager for South Bergen is Alison Brinkworth and she wants to, to hear from anyone who can help promote the useful information about the census within the community such as on Facebook page, in a newsletter, if your job involves reaching the elderly or those without internet access. She has posters and leaflets in a large variety of languages to send out to social media, messages that are ready to be used. And also, Alison can also do details to explain more to groups and people, to, groups of people too, about how the census makes a difference to everyone's life. And in the go to person to arrange extra support for your community to fill out the census. You can email uh, Alison at alison.brinkworth86 at field.census.gov.uk or her telephone number, which will also be displayed in the chat bar. Uh, her, her telephone number is 07452 93 Four eight six eight three. That's all right. I'm reading. I'm reading from a small print on uh, my telephone. Please forgive me for that. Uh, so, if you've got any questions for Alison, please put them in the chat bar. The chat bar is just here. Um, there we go. Right. Is there any questions? All 
I also wanted to do a quick briefing on um, a meeting I attended today about the Commonwealth Games. Um, it was called Proud Host City. Um, survey went out uh, to residents, um, elected members and um, staff of Birmingham City Council. Um, it wasn't that well, um, um, there wasn't that many replies, but there, there was over 600, I think. Um, I've got to tell you that as of today, there's 554 days up until the Commonwealth Games. Um, Birmingham City Council um, and the organising group are working towards uh, the Commonwealth Games in 2022. It's important um, as well because it's important to the recovery of the city. It will help re regenerate and create jobs. Um, there'll be frequent updates uh, that will go out. Um, uh, the nation will be uh, celebrating the Festival of Britain. I think the Queen as well will uh, be celebrating a, a big event. I think she's, um, I'm not sure, I think she's be 50. 50, uh, 60 or 70 years on the throne. Um, for those that criticise the uh, uh, sp the spending of, of on the Commonwealth Games, for every one pound that Birmingham City Council puts in, the government is spending three pound. Um, we it's important that we have effective engagement um, and also for the long term vision. A clear vision and um, and also I think I wanted to try and get somebody along to this evening to talk about the Commonwealth Games but I will try for a future meeting um, but there will be uh, ward monies uh, in due course um, that has been agreed so uh, we can look out at how um, that can be utilised across the whole ward, not and um, and how Sturchley can benefit, and also there'll be volunteers as well, so that that will be nice. And I've, it's going to be inclusive games too, so um, everybody can play their part, and it'll be good for all local areas, um, especially here in Sturchley. Um, uh, you know we are, you know we're on the up. As many people say, uh, with the businesses and di diverse businesses we've got, we've also on the doorstep of Cadbury's as well, and uh, we've got exciting times. So I thought that would uh, that would be that. Now I'm going to introduce. You must have had enough of me. Sorry, sorry, Chance Lock, it's Kay. Can I just butt in a second? Uh, there's one question um, about the census from Ibrahim, which and he, he asks. What do the deadline figures in the census show and what are the trends? Um, I'm not sure whether Alison's picked that up, but if she hasn't, I'll um, I'll forward that on to her and get uh, a response for Ibrahim okay. and send it on to him. If he if he'd like to send um, send me his or you his email address, then we can get a response. OK. All right, Ibrahim, uh, if you want to do that, uh, mary.lock l-o-c-k-e at birmingham.gov.uk or k.thomas at birmingham.gov.uk. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to introduce Stuart Cross. Um, he works for Kia um, and uh, he's going to give a brief update and answer questions as well. Over to you Stuart. Thank you. Good evening Council and thanks as ever for your invite. It's always a pleasure to do one of your ward meetings and hopefully we'll do one uh, in the flesh soon. So yep, so Stuart Cross and a whole way steward for Kia. Um, so Kia are the interim contract provider for the highway network within the city. So at the moment you'll be seeing us do lots of works on the highway. Uh, we we'll do some street lighting works at the moment, renewing the street lighting on Pineapple Road um, and also obviously the bigger and smaller schemes throughout the city. Um, so <laughs> Homeschooling and home parenting is always a trial. Um, so yeah, so a few questions I've had 
already come in, if you bear with me, get these in front of me now. Um, so this is from uh, Susan McLean, she asked me a question uh, about the drainage within the city, uh, how that's maintained, especially the storm drains. Um, she raises a few issues she feels we have on Bourneville Lane and on Hazelwell Street. So yeah, just a bit of general information about Bourneville Lane and well, the drains in general. Um, so, let me for one second. Yep, so the, the drains uh, are inspected by a, we have a team of inspectors. So uh, twice yearly, the, the roads are inspected, including the drains. So if one appears to be full or needs to be cleared, uh, that goes to our drainage team and they obviously pick that up. Um, we also have a program of clearance uh, as a cyclical program where our teams go out and do obviously the roads uh, on a program of clearance as well. And also we receive inquiries that come in from residents and that goes straight to our drainage team. Uh, she did point out the, the one on Bourneville Lane Bridge. Um, I did check. We haven't had any issues down there for the last 18 months. Um, I, I do know obviously there is an issue regarding, um, yes, that's fine, regarding um, obviously you've got the trees there, so you do unfortunately get some debris build up down there. But um, yeah, there's been no major concerns on that one of late. And also Hazelwell Street. There are some concerns she's raised down there, just where it meets Bourneville Lane. Um, I think the bigger issue there is more of a capacity issue. Uh, I've been there myself on, on numerous occasions. And I, I think it's more to do with capacity from Bourneville Lane and also coming down Pershall Road. Um, she also asked a question about Bourneville Lane and if there's any plans for that to be resurfaced. At the moment, there isn't any plans. However, it is obviously part of a regular inspection programme and there are jobs on there to carry out repairs on there. Um, I had a question from Mr Johnson regarding potholes. Um, not the first time I've asked, been asked this question. Uh, when the contractor comes to mend them, why do we just do one at a time that often leaves a bigger or worse pothole next to it? Um, there has been an issue in the past. We, we're hopefully getting away from that now under Kia. Um, it's a slightly different setup as to how it was under Amy. So um, what you'll see now is when we do shut a road, we will try and take care of all the potholes within the area at once. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, due to the time of year, you'll be seeing a bit less of that because of the amount of emergency repairs that Kia happens to carry out, which is obviously winter time, you get the potholes a lot more than you do in the summer. So at the moment, you probably see closures taking place or uh, the guys on the network, and we'll be dealing with the more pressing potholes at the moment. But as 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 a year progresses, when we will shut a road, you will see a lot more of the smaller potholes being taken care of. Um, you also got the issue as well, where even though it's, it's it's a defect, it may not actually come under the council's criteria for an actual repair. So obviously there's a, a criteria that it has to reach. Um, I, mean, I suppose a good example of that is, for example, tomorrow we've got uh, we're back on Carlton Road tomorrow, taking so taking care of some repairs down there. However, uh, there's also some bidder jobs due for on Carden Road. Uh, there's about three to four hundred square metres of work planned that will take place later this year, um, which obviously is a road that uh, I get quite a lot of inquiries from your councillor and obviously uh, members of the public as well. So um, I think the idea for the bidder scale works would be would it a planer in and plane off deeper and do bidder repairs which obviously I think in some sections, especially towards Ripple Road, it does need. Um, so yeah, so other big schemes you'll see later this year. I'll just keep going down so if you don't mind. Um, so these are mostly footway streams. So from now to July, you'll just see Charlotte Road, Spa Grove, Pineapple Grove, I think that may have already been done. And sections of the Pershall Road, that's been done, uh, along with Clonmere Road and Hazelwall Lane. So these are all big footway streams that you'll see over the coming months. So yeah, so good starting times ahead. So that's kind of what I've got at the moment. So obviously you've also, uh, at the moment we're doing tree planting. So you'll see some tree planting at the moment and that'll continue up until March. And also uh, here to the winter maintenance as well. So when you see the dogs on the network, um, I think we'll, we'll be out later this week, definitely the weekend. Those are the clear dogs obviously taking care of the, uh, the written as well. So um, yeah, so any questions for myself, council or members of public I can answer at all? Oh, you might be muted. 
Stuart. Stuart. Yes. Um, about Bonville Line Bridge, it's under the bridge. There's a, a drain there that can sometimes get uh, blocked as well. Um, it's right under the bridge because um, in the past it's had to have um, that, that sweeper under there. Yeah, sure. Um, OK, yeah, I mean, what I can do, I know exactly what you're it's just by the entrance to the train station. So what we can do, um, we haven't had, I say, many reports of any issues down there, but um, I can, I'm out in about 40, so I'll, I'll swim by myself and have a look at that one to see to see if it needs clearing. But I think the issue we've got there is unfortunately, it is in a bit of a dip, so it does fill up quite quickly with debris. And if they're not clearing it with, with the, the, the street cleansers too regular, uh, it does build up. But yeah, no, I'll, I'll certainly pay about a visit. No problem at all, Councillor. No problem there. Um, I've got it. Somebody's just come through on the phone. There's a uh, Mr. Ravenscroft. Okay. Um, he wants to uh, put a question. Um, if you can put it in the chat bar uh, where the uh, details of the census and I've put something in there too. We're on mute. Sorry, Councillor Lock. There is a question for Stuart which says, where are you planning the trees? As a rule of thumb, um, the trees go back into the location, probably the question, wherever the trees are taken out of, they'll go back in. Um, so there's no additional trees, unfortunately, but part of the contract that here have is Every tree that's failed, it will go back in the same location. The only time that's, that, that would alter would be if, um, say for whatever reason, underground services. So when the guys are removing the old stump, they can't grind down enough due to proximities of gas, electric, etc. Sometimes you might get uh, more recently uh, the Virgin Media go quite within, quite close to the proximity of the stump. So if the guys can't grind down the stump out, they may have to then sort of cap it off and then we might move it slightly further down the road. However, it's always kept within the same ward and ideally we've on the same road because obviously people are used to having a certain amount of trees, especially under Amy and Kia um, in the last 10 or 11 years. So uh, yeah, we, we try never to you know move trees from a road because it, it just keeps everything um, yeah, nicely balanced really. But, um, so if I answer your question. That was, was that it? Any, are there any more questions? Yeah, there's a couple. Um, hold on if you can just bear with me. Um, one, somebody asks, could the storm drain be checked at junction of Bond Street and Oxford Street? There's a lake there today. OK, yep, yeah, no problem. I know exactly um, where. And there's a thank you from Mr Charlton to Stuart and your team for the prompt repair of a reported pothole on Cartland Road about three hours from report to it being filled. Good work. Oh, good. I shall, I shall take credit for that one. No, no, obviously what we do have, we do have about five uh, emergency teams on standby 24-7 throughout the city. So if someone does report a dangerous pothole, uh, we'll get there within a few hours and obviously on the back of that, that's when you'll get uh, a full repair within 35 days. So that's why at the moment, uh, when we do unfortunately have to do the emergency repairs, we're doing less of the non-emergency works because the time of year, there's so many potholes that more, almost come up overnight sometimes. So um, it is a busy time for our emergency teams, but um, yeah, that's, that's good to hear. Thanks to, thanks to that. I'll pass it on to the team. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, no, Councillor Locke, I think that's all of them. Well, thank you ever so much, Stuart, and uh, I'll be in touch, no doubt, soon. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Always a pleasure. I'll, I'll, I'll stay on, so if anybody else does 
pop up a question. I'll, I'll be I'll be in the background, no problem. Thank you. All right, thank you. Right. Over to me again. And uh, now I'm gonna invite um Gavin Smith from West Midlands Rail Exec and John Myatt from Birmingham City Council to give an update on the Hazelwell line. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Can you hear me OK? Can everyone hear me OK? Well, I can. Well, that's good. I'm yes, gonna, thanks. I'm we take can hear that. you. Uh, so what I'm going to do, if I may, um, is just share um, my screen um, and I'll just run through a very brief um, presentation, first of all. Um, but I would like to just um, say I was listening to Stuart's uh, um, what Stuart was saying. I'm so impressed that there's a three hour pothole repair. Uh, that's absolutely incredible. Um, I mean, I think you can go snorkeling in the potholes uh, around the village where I live. So uh, that's that's really good. Um, anyway, on to um, the Camp Hill line update. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Gavin Smith. I'm the scheme sponsor for the West Midlands Rail Executive uh, for this uh, particular scheme. So I'm going to run through this brief presentation just to give you an update of uh, progress on the project and then take any questions that you may have. So for those of you who are unaware of the project, this is a scheme okay. to reopen three stations that closed back in 1941 on the Camp Hill line. Uh, which is uh, a railway line that exists. It operates uh, freight services and cross-country services from uh, Birmingham down into the southwest and uh, South Wales use this, this railway. But we're looking to reopen the stations at Moseley, Kingsheath and Hazelwell that closed back in 1941. And there's a, a lot of reasons why we would seek to do this. Um, these are um, in, the, in the bullet points on this particular slide, but we're looking at increasing and improving the connectivity for those three communities uh, for, for work, for education and for leisure opportunities. Um, there's a strong environmental benefit for doing this, uh, moving travel away from cars, um, and moving travel away from con the congested local road network onto a clean uh, railway system. There's economic growth that can be supported by this scheme, encouraging um, businesses to perhaps relocate into this part of Birmingham, but certainly encouraging people to go from this part of Birmingham using the national rail network connections at, at New Street and at Kings Norton. It gives uh, people within the area an alternative transport choice and a way of getting around. And all of that translates into uh, some quite good numbers of estimated journeys per annum from Moseley, Kingsheath and Hazelwell, which gives us a, as a project high value for money um, for a taxpayer return. Now, um, probably you'll ask, well, what about post COVID? And do those numbers still stack up? And clearly COVID has had a very significant impact on ridership uh, on all forms of public transport. And yes, you know, these numbers are pre-COVID, but, you know, COVID will eventually be resolved by vaccination. Um, numbers will come back to the railway network. I don't think anyone quite knows when and how quickly, but I think we can all be pretty certain that um, numbers will come back and clearly, you know, uh, an investment in new stations and a new railway service is a long term commitment and not just something to consider over a three, four, five year period. It's something that, you know, the business case is put together over a, a 60 year period. So the, the, the service will actually deliver uh, good revenue returns and certainly pre COVID the operational expenditure was paid back within three years after opening the, the service. If you actually look at this diagram here, I, I think that I've used this in a number of um, uh, sessions, but the um, 
sort of purple coloured circles show a 1.2 kilometre radius around existing railway stations and the sort of mustardy yellow coloured circles show a 1.2 kilometre radius around uh, Moseley, Kingsheath and Hazelwell. And I think it's quite clear that um, these three new stations serve uh, a new rail market and that is why this scheme um, is I think such an important scheme because it can actually tap into a new rail market and get uh, car traffic off the road uh, and reduce congestion and improve the local environment and improve opportunities for local people. And we're looking at some of the uh, journey time savings there by rail compared to car and bus. And clearly these are significant savings which will benefit uh, everybody. Uh, we're talking to the Department for Transport about the way that the um, service fits into national, subnational, and local strategies, uh, mostly around investment and planning policy. And the good news is that the uh, service has a strong strategic fit. I won't go through the, the detail, but you can see that actually we've thought in great detail about how this scheme links into all of those relevant strategies. I think this is an important slide and I've used this again to demonstrate um, the importance of these uh, new stations to local communities. And what happens here is that we look at the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of relative um, earnings potential and wealth of people within particular parts of uh, the city. And what you can see here with this uh, map is that the darker the red shade, the um, less wealthy the, um, the average uh, person is in that particular part of the community. Um, and so I think the important thing here is, you know, the government talks about levelling up and whatever your, I suppose, political persuasion, I think the message here is that we want to give opportunities to as many people as possible and spread them as widely as possible. And clearly um, linking communities that do not enjoy a good rail service uh, to, to the national rail network is a great way of giving people more opportunities for work, education and leisure. And, you know, this slide is, a, I suppose, a, a good way of explaining um, that that is what these three stations actually do. So, again, you know, um, this is why there is wide support for the scheme. The proposed new service structure um, is two trains per hour running between Kings Norton and Birmingham New Street, calling at Hazelwell, Kings Heath and Mosley on the way, formed with brand new rolling stock, um, a four car class 196 diesel unit. And I've got some pictures uh, of such a train for those of you who are not currently standing at the end of platforms uh, looking at uh, trains coming through and might not be familiar with what a class 196 is. These trains are so new that currently they're under construction. Um, the detailed timetable is currently with Network Rail for consideration. And I'll come on to that, if I may, in a moment. So for the scheme, what will you get? Well, you will get three new stations. You will get station at Mosley, Kingsheath and Hazelwell. They'll all look pretty similar insofar as there'll be two platforms, each uh, uh, six car, uh, six carriage long. So uh, able to accommodate a six carriage train with canopies. Um, they're fully accessible. So there is uh, access through lifts and through stairs between platforms. The stations will not be staffed, but there will be state of the art ticket machines at each station entrance customer information systems, passenger help points, um, a small forecourt at the station entrance, and in the case of Hazelwell and Mosley, a small pick up and drop off loop, but there are no car parks, uh, which I think is familiar uh, information to most people. There'll be secure cycle parking, and we've really ramped up the uh, number of cycle parking spaces, um, really to sort of uh, try and encourage uh, this sustainable and green form of transport. Uh, 
so I've got some artist impressions. Some of you may have seen these before. Some of you may not. And I think they probably do more than anything else to visualise what uh, this investment will bring to the local community. So here we are at Moseley looking south, the existing Moseley tunnel. Uh, you can see the full length canopies along the platform, uh, providing excellent cover for passengers. Uh, moving south, we're here we are at Kings Heath, we're on the Ulster Road uh, looking towards Moseley and you can see here the sort of entrance to the station, uh, small forecourt area, um, cycle storage and the lifts heading down to the platforms below. And finally at Hazelwell, uh, now um, for those of you um, and you'll probably all be familiar with Hazelwell, um, the lift shaft and the station entrance in the distance with the tree, that's um, the location of the uh, bathroom showroom at the moment. You can see there's a fairly significant level difference. So the area where the cars are turning is currently an area of green space and then Cartland Road is on your right. I mentioned the new class 196 diesel trains um, which will serve this particular route. And as you can see, they are in fact so new that um, the body shells are being fitted out with seats. The seats have got the, the plastic covers on them, so they are as as new a trains as you can get uh, anywhere, pretty much. And in terms of the timescales we're working towards at the moment, um, and I'll come on to this in a bit more detail uh, just presently, uh, we're working with the Department for Transport, who are going to be the primary funder for this scheme and um, we're, we're doing that with a view to uh, securing funding during the first part of the first quarter of this year. Uh, funding also uh, being provided by Birmingham City Council and the West Midlands Combined Authority. And then later on this year, we plan to award the detailed design and build contract. Uh, so that's to go out to the market and uh, invite tenders from interested parties to actually do the very detailed nuts and bolts design and actually build the stations. And then in late 2023, the aim is to open the stations and begin serving the communities. So um, what I will do, if I may, is stop sharing my screen. Um, I talked a little bit there about um, the work that we're doing with the Department for Transport and I think the important thing to say about the this uh, this particular scheme is that we're at a, a particularly, um, I suppose, important time in the project life cycle. Um, the scheme in terms of you know development, design development, is ready, um, and we have taken it to the combined authority, and we are taking it to the Department for Transport and asking for the necessary funding to now deliver the work. And we have a date in the diary next month with the Department for Transport to um, ask for the necessary funding to progress the scheme. So clearly, you know, this is a big day in the diary. Um, this is very important for uh, the success of this scheme, uh, but we are confident that um, we have got the necessary information that the Department for Transport needs to actually uh, provide the funding. Now, those of you, uh, I don't live in the West Midlands, but for those of you who are listening to ITN a few weeks ago, may well have seen a television appearance by Andy Street talking about the uh, this particular scheme, and he made mention to a what he called a funding gap um, in in the sort of uh, funding for this particular scheme. So I'm going to be I'm, I'm going to be quite open with you. I'm going to tell you um, pretty much what um, Andy Street said. Um, railway projects are, um, I suppose, maybe like all significant infrastructure projects are expensive uh, projects to build. And it is quite common. It's not it's not unusual as schemes develop. Uh, for funding gaps to appear. Um, so I think Andy was very candid and very open with ITN uh, about the challenges facing this particular scheme. Um, 
Now, what we are seeking to do um, next month with the Department for Transport is to answer the questions they've put to us about this scheme with a view to securing the necessary funding uh, to move the scheme forward. Um, Andy uh, said in that report that there is a funding gap and that will need to be secured through um, a future spending review settlement. Um, and I'm confident, if the mayor is confident, as a scheme sponsor, I am confident that uh, that will come to pass. Uh, the important thing for me and everyone involved in this scheme at the moment is to make sure that the Department for Transport at our meeting next month um, have all of the answers to the questions that they've raised about the scheme, the scheme costs, um, the business case uh, to present the scheme in a very, very positive light and to get the necessary approvals to to take the scheme forward. Um, so lots of challenges, but um, I feel actually we're in quite a good place um, to move forward. So I think probably um, I would now um, like to ask sort of anyone for any questions uh, that they may have uh, about this particular scheme and the wider West Midlands uh, Rail programme. Uh, thank you, Councillor. That's my pleasure. Right, has anyone got any questions? Anyone got any questions? Uh, there must, be, there must, be, some, yeah, there must be some questions. There are. Um, there's a question um, about, but I'm not sure whether you're going to be able to answer this one, Gavin, or whether John might be able to answer it. Uh, um, asking about the an LTN for Cecil Road. Um, there's also another question about, um, have there been any definite plans uh, about changes to parking on Cartland Road? And also another question, um, regarding traffic control on Pineapple Road. There's lots of speeding at present. What traffic calming and parking restriction measures are planned? John, uh, did you want to um, sort of take those initially? Uh, yeah, can, can people hear me? I can. I yeah. can. can. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, yeah, happy to take those. Um, <clears throat> so I suppose there's two elements to this. There's low traffic neighbourhoods uh, that we're taking forward currently as part of the government's emergency active travel <coughs> fund, which is now entrenched to going to be called the active travel fund. Um, so we're taking forward some or there are some trials on the ground at the moment, um, not in this area, but Prove, providing they are successful and we're, we're also doing a review of all of our <coughs> emergency active travel fund schemes, tranche one schemes, we will then look to roll more out, uh, more low traffic neighbourhoods out in the future. Um, so we, we've had a quick look at look at this and um, <coughs> so Joe Green, who is our travel demand manager, who some of you may know, um, has has been looking at <coughs> different areas um, and, and this could be an area if we get further funding for these kind of measures that could come forward. Um, so so we're not saying no, um, it, it's certainly at our policy and, and current strategy to, to roll these out further, but um, we don't currently, I don't want to raise expectations too much that something's going to happen straight away because we don't currently have the funding to do it in this area. Um, the second point I'd make is that working with Councillor Locke, we have committed to looking at the wider uh, access to the station outside of what um, WMRE are doing. However, the, the next stage of that really is to have a face to face um, workshop with everyone to get your ideas um, and, and take that forward. Um, <clears throat> we've got a bit of time before the stations are opened, as, as, as Gavin has, has alluded to. So. Um, we've still got time to do that um, and as soon as we can we'll be setting up a workshop um, where you'll all be able to feed in your ideas 
and and we can come up with that wider access access strategy and some of that could include a low traffic neighborhood or low traffic neighborhood measures in this area um, and can also look at, at speeding issues as, as as have been highlighted um so hopefully that covers all of the questions i, I appreciate it's not we're going to come out and do something about it now um but i think the current lockdown is currently limiting what uh, sort of what extensive sort of workshops and consultation we can do and and as the people that live in this area we can't we're not going to take forward measures without your input um in terms of parking that is something that is specifically within was talked about at the planning application stage and and there was a um an area i think it was 250 meters around the station where some some um parking measures were proposed again <clears throat> the actual measures that go in will be subject to public consultation so um as soon as we can with wmre we will we will come out and speak to you about those um so i suppose it's it sort of watch this space um but yeah low traffic neighborhoods we're rolling them out as a trial and then subject to them being successful and the review that we're currently doing um we'll we'll then look for further areas as funding becomes available um, and obviously we will we will work with local councillors such as councillor lock-in identifying areas where where they would be suitable there's a there's another one um that i think might be for you john uh, somebody's asking could you elaborate on cycle facilities and then there's a, a couple that i think might be for gavin um somebody's at, mike's asking uh, why the line won't be electrified given national climate change and su sustainability goals um and then there was another question can freight trains be used to bring in materials for the station okay i think i'll probably take all of those actually um i mean in terms of cycle facilities at the station then each of the three stations will feature cycle parking for at least 30 cycles uh, I think at Mosley it's slightly more because we've got just more space to um, use there on the forecourt. Um, and that will be covered, not fully enclosed, but covered and CCTV monitored back to our um, control room at Summer Lane. So we're very, very keen in conjunction with Birmingham City Council to encourage sustainable access to the station. So primarily through walking and cycling, that's how we, you know, want to pitch the stations these are stations for the local community for people really to walk and cycle rather than um, get in their car we don't have car parks we have limited um, uh, facilities for car parking so it's very much um, a, a cycle and walking based um, station um, the the question was um, so there was a, a question about electrification um, now our scheme uh, that, that, that I am responsible for is not specifically going to electrify this particular part of the railway network. However, um, everything that we do must have the, the, the sort of um, techie term is passive provision for electrification. So that means that when we build new structures, we must uh, assume that at some stage in the future, uh, the line will be electrified. So, for example, you would build a footbridge. If it was a new footbridge over the railway, you would build it so that when the line was electrified in the future, it was of the suitable height. Uh, so there's things like that. So we need to construct uh, new stations with a view that uh, as and when the route is electrified, there's not you know, we don't have to knock them down and start again in simplistic terms. Um, the network rail do have uh, what they call a decarbonisation strategy, um, which you might say, well, is just an electrification plan. I think there's other ways to decarbonise the railway now. So, for example, it could be hybrid trains, battery trains, hydrogen trains. There's lots of technology that's at the research and development stage. Um, so there is um, a, a you know real push within network rail to 
reduce its carbon footprint around uh, the UK. Um, I would imagine that the Camp Hill line at some stage in the future will be a subject to an electrification proposal. Um, I don't have privy to you know when that may be. I would imagine it would probably form part of um, you know something post Midlands Rail Hub. Um, so certainly we our project is not specifically delivering electrification, but nor is it preventing it happening. Everything that we build will enable electrification to take place. And I think while we're on the subject of climate, um, the whilst the trains that are proposed to serve the Camp Hill line are diesel trains, um, you know, there's no getting around that. They are the very latest design of diesel engine. They are very low emission. Uh, and in fact, given the amount of um, journeys they will take off the local road network in themselves um, are you know, hugely beneficial to the local environment and local air quality. Um, I think there was another question about can freight trains be used to bring materials to the station? Uh, and I think um, there is a, a place for um, freight um, to help construct uh, railway projects. Typically, you will find network rail use freight to uh, bring in aggregates. So things like, you know, heavy stone ballast, remove contaminated ballast, bring in new ballast. Um, now, there's clearly going to be parts of the station that will probably need to be brought in by road. So I don't want to promise you that uh, there will be absolutely no vehicle movements because everything's going to be brought in by rail. That's actually not really practical. But um, certainly, um, you know, we will be working closely with network rail to try and use as much rail based access as possible. Uh, now, that could be through trains, as I say, certainly with ballast, replacing ballast, um, heavy materials that tends to come in by train anyway. Um, and if there's a way that we can actually bring items in under a possession of the railway line when rail traffic has stopped and we can bring that in and trundle that along the railway network, then we will do so. Um, but certainly we will need to produce um, a very detailed construction management plan for the local community, which explains how we're going to build the station and the impact on the local community and the local road network. Can I come in, please? Please do. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to answer Adrian. Um, Adrian, um, about the low traffic neighbourhood on uh, Cecil Road, I did email you about that. That is being looked at. I spoke, uh, I emailed Joe Green, his name has been mentioned uh, by John. Um, and that is one of the roads that is being looked at for a low traffic neighbourhood. Uh, but also Cecil Road is not in Sturchley, it is in the Bournebrook and at Selly Park um, ward. So that that is, is for that. Just wanted to answer that. I'm going to report about the, the sweeping um, and if there's any issues regarding the, you know, this road's not being swept. It's not uh, part of Kia. That comes to me. So if you wanted to email me, please do so. Councillor Lott, there's just one more question, I think, for Gavin that's just come through. Um, John's asking two trains an hour. Is that because of capacity at New Street? And what is the long term to increase the number of trains at rush hour? Is two trains enough? OK, um, so yes, two trains an hour is the proposal to start the service off. Uh, we believe based on um, our modelling um, and the demand that two trains an hour is adequate to kickstart the service. But longer term, I think the key to unlocking the future demand for the Camp Hill line rests with the Midlands Rail Hub. And there's a number of aspects to that, but in terms of Camp Hill and in terms of the stations at Mosby, Kingseath and Hazelwell, there's two parts to that. 
the first part is remodeling at Kings Norton and the second part is um, providing what's known as the, as the Bordley Cord which links the Camp Hill line with the line into Moore Street and Snow Hill. Now that's a brand new piece of infrastructure that's never existed before uh, but what that will enable is trains to access straight from Mosley into Birmingham Moore Street and Birmingham Snow Hill so it gives you an opportunity to serve all Birmingham stations from the Camp Hill line. That's the way we would be able, together with the intervention at Kings Norton, that's the way we would be able to increase the capacity of local passenger services on the Camp Hill line. And just looking at Kings Norton, for those of you familiar with the station, uh, there is a centre centre platform, which whilst it's sort of physically there, it's been out of use for many, many years. Um, the railway lines immediately adjacent to it are not electrified. So there would be a, to, 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 as part of the Midlands hub um, project, there is a plan to bring that centre platform back into use, electrify all lines between Kings Norton all the way down through Northfield to uh, Longbridge and uh, to Bank Green. That will provide the additional flexibility and the additional capacity um, at both ends of the Camp Hill line, which will then be able to uh, increase the service along that route. Hope that answers the, the question. Is there any, are there any more questions? I think that seems to be all of them. Right. OK, well, thank you both very much. Uh, we look forward to having future updates. And will you let us know if uh, your talks with the Department of Transport are successful? And I Cer uh, certainly will, Councillor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Um, yeah, be very pleased to come back and uh, tell you about progress there. Yeah, because I and I know. I mean, we were going to have a meeting at um, Dad's Lane Community uh, Association, which is just opposite the. Um, it's an ideal place. For, it's uh, just opposite the where the, the station will be. Um, you know, and perhaps you know we were going to have it. I think it was last year. I think uh, we we're going to have a and get um, highways yourselves and. Uh, you know, to, you know, have it like an open day so people could come in, have a look, put their questions, suggestions, concerns. Um, I mean, maybe we can do that. I don't know. Well, depending how it goes, maybe yep. towards the latter end of the year, uh, um, we might be able to, even if it's restricted on on numbers, you know, pace them out or something like that. So yeah, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Absolutely. Well, um I look forward to you know coming back and doing these sort of things in person because it's you know yeah. it's no substitute for you know being there and speaking to people you know sort of face to face rather than uh, via Teams. But um, it's been really really useful um, and thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, uh, we like to keep up to date with it and. Uh, you know, the, the, but we'll see how it goes. So we might be able to, if I know, if you let me know, because the next next meeting is in March, so we can okay. make the announcement. So that would be something to be of information. But yeah, thank, thank you, you both, and uh, look forward to seeing you again. Stay safe. Thank you. Are we are we okay? Uh, am I thank am you. I okay to? Can I be excused? Yeah, you can be excused. <laughs> <laughs> OK, all right. What if I said no? <laughs> I'd have to I'd have to I'd have to sit here obediently. <laughs> OK, it's a long day, so you get going and, and you. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thank you, <clears throat> Councillor. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, th thank you, everyone. Um, um, I'll give a brief update um, of uh, what's been going on. I mean, we've had the we've had a small trial of the um, the transport with bollards in Sturchley. Um, some of them have worked, some of it hasn't. 
Um, you know, some of them had to come out because of obviously, um, you know, I know many people prefer walking, cycling, um, but there are uh, businesses and they need deliveries. Um, and it was, you know, it was agreed by the cabinet member when I invited him uh, and I had a look to see the impact. Uh, but I'm hoping to keep some of the ones that we've got left in. Bourneville Lane, uh, some of the measures there, we're doing a project uh, with Cadbury's. Um, we, um, that Cadbury's are paying for some uh, some work on, on the road so that uh, to try and stop the lorries going up Bourneville Lane and um, um, uh, you know, going under the bridge and causing ha um, havoc, really. Well, they don't get there, they reverse back down and it causes an awful lot of problems for residents and it's been going on for years. So hopefully that will start um, maybe um, sort of March time, April time. So we're looking forward to getting that done. Um, Taylor Wimpy, as you know, don't know, have uh, bought uh, some of the Seven Capital land and they've got plans in. Um, they, you can go on to the Birmingham City Council planning portal and put comments in. Uh, the, it's about 87 houses. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other things that, um, you know, I think um, Sturchley have done quite well with um you know with covid and you know that we've been able to get messages out to people um last year there was some funding because we're a pioneer place and we took um had leaflets printed with information on um and there's a meeting tomorrow with community groups to discuss some funding and uh, what what can do to help with the COVID situation um, and, and lockdown. So that will um, that will be useful. Um, but have anyone got any questions? I'm trying to look through the uh, Q&A, but please send me them or type in if you can. There's no new questions at the minute, Councillor Locke. No. Oh, I handed in a petition last week for to look at uh, some uh, safer um, traffic measures on um, uh, Ford House Lane, Windsor Road and uh, Persia Road, the, the turning there. Um, and I, um, the petition had a response today, so the highways engineer Sajid Khan um, is going to get in touch about that. So uh, we'll see what can be done. I mean, obviously, we'll consult with people and the residents about it. So uh, uh, a lot of it's to do with the the former fireworks shop, as everybody calls it, former news agents, um, because the people that are, whoever owns that lives abroad and it's trying to get hold of them. But uh, uh, that's about it, really. Um, if there's nothing else. Anything else? I hope everyone's staying safe. Um, my contact details, are, I can be contacted via email. Um, Mary.lock at birmingham.gov.uk um, uh, or um, can call me on 077-033-72981 if uh, any time. So shall I announce that when the next meeting is? The next meeting I think I want everybody to wear green because it's going to be St Patrick's Day, so um, the 17th of March and we're getting the um, agenda together. <coughs> Thankfully Kay 
worked very hard and I want to thank her for you know being the producer or whatever this is um, tonight. It's not the same as having a face to face meeting and I hope probably we can have have one very soon and um, please stay safe, take care and, and I look forward to seeing you in the near future. Say hello um, if you see me on the high street or anywhere at a safe distance obviously and don't forget the mask if you have to wear a few if you can please. Okay and I wish you a good evening. Thanks Councillor Locke.